Hello, everybody. Welcome yet again to Perspectives of Change. I'm your host, Sarika Karbanda. Quick introduction of the show, Perspectives of Change. At Perspectives of Change, we are dedicated to exploring how to not change forward by understanding and valuing multiple perspectives, because our perspective as a change agent is just one of many. And I think it's very interesting that with this as the theme or the focus of the show, the topic that we have for today is journeying through Edward de Bono's six thinking hats. And it's all about perspectives that these hats get for us or we bring through these hats. And we're going to figure out what that journey is and to bring more, uh, what am I looking for as a word, more insights and more practitioner experiences into this whole topic. We've got an amazing guest dialing in from Perth, I believe. And that's Fran Comack. And I believe I pronounced your name correctly. Yes. Thank you, Sarika. So Fran Cormack, dialing in from Perth, probably guess from the accent. I'm not Australian. I hail from West Yorkshire in England. And um, yes, I'm very excited to have a conversation today around perspectives and around how we can use the De Bono classic six thinking hats to um, better appreciate and draw out some of those perspectives. So I'm very excited. Awesome. Friend, do you want to do you want to give us a little more introduction about what you do? I think that would be great to start this topic with. Yeah, thank you. I'm a leadership coach, team coach, facilitator, done some training as well, a bit of mentoring. Um, been around businesses for, for many years. Um, came to Australia about 12 years ago. Um, deep experience in project management. But for the last maybe five, six years, moved into the field of professional coaching. And a lot of my time now is spent with um, individuals and with teams and organizations, helping them achieve what I would call more effective ways of working and some of the tools and techniques they can use to achieve some of that elusive high performance. Awesome. And uh, I do want to bring this one more point out from your, in, uh, like into your introduction, because I was a part of this amazing book club that you started off last year. So do you want to just give us a line or two about the book club that you're running? Yeah, yeah, thank you. So books are one of my passions. And we're here today to talk about a book. And so not surprisingly, I'm, I'm a big lover of books. And one of the, I think, techniques I took from um I think it was liberating structures many years ago was how to create a learning organization. And one of the tips was, why don't you create a book club? Yeah. So I've tried to do this in many organizations I've been in, and some have been more effective than others. But what you find is the passionate book lovers turn up. Now, um, this time last year, I got talking to a colleague here in Perth, um, Ro Gorel, my, my colleague, and she's written her own book. She's an author. And we said, why, why don't we start doing a book club virtually? So uh -huh. we can try and attract people from across the globe. We started out as an experiment. It's been going about a year. Um, great to see your face there at many of those book clubs and share some of your perspectives. We meet about once a month and it's a bit different to your normal book club. This book club, one of the volunteers turns up and shares a book they've been reading and some of the insights and facilitate a conversation around some of those insights. So hopefully we, we learn of new books, we learn of new techniques and we get inspired to ourselves come to future book clubs and share what we've been reading. So yes, the virtual book club is proven to be quite successful. Yes, and, and I intentionally wanted to bring that out because I think it's it's also very linked with the six thinking hats, ain't it? Uh, we yes. are talking of different perspectives and you know, when someone like, let's say yourself, you bring out a book in the book club and you're talking about it, it's your perspective. And then I know everybody, you know, puts the questions around and we are all talking about how we interpreted it. And it's so very unique and different. I, I still remember so many takeaways from, you know, the book clubs that I've attended and participated in. So that's been amazing, which leads me into the amazing question that we have diving right into today's topic of Edward de Bono's Six Thinking Hats. Uh, give us a backdrop, right, to start with why the six thinking hats you know so what's give us a backdrop to start with let's just leave it yeah. at that. yeah okay so for people not familiar with edward de bono's six thinking hats and i'll give a quick show of the book well we'll show the book again later on but it's a bit of a classic it was first published in way back in i believe 1985 
And it's a long time ago. We're talking now maybe almost 40 years old. And I came across that book maybe another 10, 15 years after that, going through um, some studies in, in management. And you find it's, it's very effective. And, and through the studies, you, you play with the technique and you use it with the groups and you find it's, it is very effective in, in what it does. But then over those, I've been working now probably about 30 years, just to give my age away a little bit. Um, what I'm quite surprised to find out is I very rarely see it used in teams and organizations, despite this being available and out there for almost 40 years and being so powerful. Um, very few people actually use it. And I hear leaders and organizations talk a lot, Sarika, about the need for critical thinking, the need for lateral thinking. And I just wonder how well those terms are really understood and if people want critical thinking or lateral thinking and they're not using the six thinking hats, I'd love to know what techniques they're using because, as I said, I, I don't see much of it in organizations that I work with. Hmm. That's an interesting point, actually, you bring out. And I'm sparked with two questions there. Do you think it makes sense, first of all, to even set the context for people new to this whole topic of critical thinking and lateral thinking? You know, should we even maybe even just talk about what that is and why is that a need in today's world maybe yeah absolutely yeah it's a great um it's a great conversation starter i think when i think about my experience working with teams there's a few traps that we can fall into mm -hmm. one of the traps is a psychological term called groupthink it's been coined coined many years ago groupthink is the the trap the cognitive trap we fall into where in a team we all tend to agree with each other because of various reasons, most commonly the most popular one would be a lack of psychological safety, but lots of other reasons. Um, Hierarchy is in the room, power dynamics. Oh, yeah. When we're in a team, we we often are afraid to speak out. We fall into groupthink. So we're not always getting the best perspective. We're not always getting the most rounded and effective decisions made. So groupthink is is one of them. I think another trap so we could people fall into is we see a lot of egos in teams, a lot of egos in groups, a lot of egos in organizations. So if if, if myself and, and yourself are part of a team and we're discussing a topic, we might find ourselves falling into the trap of debating each other mm -hmm. and then spiraling a little bit because my ego is saying, I've got to get the better of Sarika with this conversation and, and vice versa, you might with me. So we're kind of facing off against each other. And again, not very effective. And, and when you read the six thinking hats and go through the process, rather than facing up against each other, what you find is we start facing in the same direction. So we start looking in the same direction when we're discussing the topic through the various six thinking hats that we'll talk about. But you'll find then that we're not fighting each other, we're with each other. So I think that's, that's an important outcome you get if you were to use a critical thinking or lateral thinking technique, such as the six thinking hats. Nice, nice, love that. Should we maybe just set the context, Fran, then of what is the six thinking hats? You know, what are we really talking about? Of course, we see six hats on your background there, Zoom background, uh, white, yellow, black, green, blue, red. Uh, just wanted to say that out loud for our uh, listeners. <laughs> and yeah. the viewers can, of course, see the image there. And yes, I've got another image out here of the same six hats here, same colors. But just tell us a little more, you know, what are these six thinking hats? And then, then let's just unravel a little more. Yeah. I'll start with what the hats are not, because I think it's very important. People listeners to this podcast, video cast, will, will no doubt be familiar with personality styles. There's lots of tools we can use to discover what personality type somebody might be, be that you know, the DISC technique and the Myers-Briggs is used in Enneagram. There's lots of different ones that might provide a discussion point around somebody's personality. Now, the six thinking hats are not labels. So you won't find people who are a white hat type person. You won't find people who are a red hat type person because they're not labels and they're not descriptors. Mm. They're just a metaphor for a type of thinking that we all do together. So for example, the, um, the blue hat is, is one probably least used through the process, but the blue hat in De Bono is the process hat. So it's the process of how we'll use the six thinking hats in this session. What does the process look like? What steps might we go through? What do we aim to achieve at the end? So we might all say, let's put on the blue hat metaphorically 
And if you've got hats in the room, if you make the hats for a big conference, you might put the blue hat on. But then everyone's inhabiting that blue hat and everybody's thinking along the same lines. They're all, again, facing the same direction. Um, the brain can only really process one thing at a time. We know that from neuroscience and the myth of multitasking. We, we switch tracks in our brain. We don't do two things at once. So what the six thinking hats is really effective at doing is, is, is saying, rather than considering a big problem in all its entirety, why don't we just metaphorically put one of the hats on and just consider it from that one perspective before then moving on to the other perspectives? Nice. Yeah, I, I think this is good. Do you do you also want to talk a little about each of the colors of the hat or do you want to then directly jump into, you know, how does this work as a process? Yeah, so what I'll do, I'll, I'll talk about what I've seen work, um, what I've seen not work very well. Mm -hmm. So I've been in workshops where the facilitators, in theory, are using this process, and they've said, we've got a black hat, and the black hat is the critical thinking hat. So black's not bad, white's not good, and the black hat in De Bono's thinking is never meant to be any negative connotations. It's simply the, the critical thinking hat, which is an important um, aspect of thinking. But the workshops that I've been involved in in the past mistakenly just assigned one hat to people in a big group. So, Ika, will you be the devil's advocate for this session? Mm. So what we had then was one person, only one person in the group, critical thinking, everybody else not really wearing a hat and not knowing where they are in terms of the thinking. So it wasn't very coherent. But all we had was whatever was whatever thinking was occurring over here in the group, and that was a bit incoherent, over here, you had one person with a black hat on trying to be the critical thinker to the rest of the group. And it wasn't a really effective process. And I started, that kind of piqued my interest a little bit around why why is this technique, A, not used very much, like I talked about in the introduction, and B, when I see it used, why is it used ineffectively? Hmm. Because, for example, if we've, if we've got a problem to solve, um, such as... I'll give one example from the book, actually. If you don't mind me just going into the book and giving an example sure. of how effective it is. There's um, a telecommunications company in Australia called Optus. And in the book, they quote the company and they had a meeting that a kind of a gnarly problem, an issue to, to deal with, a wicked problem. And they set aside four hours for this problem. Experience had shown them that the people and all the personalities, it's probably going to take about four hours. Okay. They went through the process of looking at that problem through the six thinking hats, which is let's put the green hat on. Let's all be a little bit creative. Let's take that hat off. Let's now put the red hat on and let's all look together. And let's think about thoughts, feelings, and emotions that are assigned to what we've just thought about. Mm. And then we'll take that hat off. We might now put the black hat on. We've heard lots of great things. But what's the perspective we're not thinking about? What's the possible tripwire that might trip us up? So we're all thinking about that. Through this process, Optus did that session in 45 minutes. Awesome. And they had four hours. For, and this is a big, we've all worked in, and many people have worked in large corporate organizations and we've seen what these meetings look like. A four hour meeting, we're doing 45 minutes with a very effective outcome because they had everybody literally on the same page metaphorically wearing the same hat and they just move through the thinking process hat by hat ending up back to the blue hat which is again the process hat let's just wrap up the steps we've been through where have we got to and you close it all out with the blue hat so an organization using that effectively can have very short meetings that they previously assigned four hours for i love that example because of course, it can make meetings shorter, productive. I mean, you and I have discussed. So I, I use this quite often with the teams I work with. So I enable teams. I think this is one of the critical approaches that I think is a must have with teams, especially if, you know, you want your teams to be more self-organized and make their own decisions, especially if you're empowering your teams, let them get the holistic picture of a problem, right? Because they are going to Otherwise, just look in one direction and then you're probably not going to consider all alternatives, right? And yeah. like you rightly said, it, you know, bringing, bringing together, let's say, the creative 
pieces from the green hat thinking, uh, the feelings and emotions from the red hat thinking, the devil advocate perspective from the black hat thinking. And given the data that you have available for a certain problem, you're discussing the facts from the white hat thinking and so on, right? So I think that gives people a complete holistic picture of anything pretty much at hand. So a lot of benefits that I see, and then we also still see a lot of organizations and teams struggling with not using this or not using it correctly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. One of the terms that sometimes gets, it's, it's a bit confusing, parallel thinking is used throughout the book as a Hmm. This this process is used to enhance parallel thinking, and and it does sound a bit of a strange term. It probably takes it's probably worth um, a minute to kind of unpack what parallel thinking means. And the example given in the in the book is let's imagine there's there's four people, and there's a large house, a very large house, and one person's at the front of the house, one's at the back, and a person each at the sides of the house. And I say, Sarika. What's your view of the house? And you say the house. Oh, there's three windows. There's no door here. And, no, it's not the same house I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. well, why, what, what do you see? I'm at the front of the house. Oh, well, I see five windows. I see plant pots. I see I see a bright red front door with a knocker on there. Oh, people at the side of the house. Oh, we must be at a different house to you because we're not seeing any windows or any doors. Yeah. How well thinking is, get all four people to the front of the house. What are you seeing? Ah, we're all seeing the bright red door. We're all seeing the, the flower boxes. Let's all walk to the back. We're all seeing the same thing. So that, that's thinking in parallel. So through the book, they talk about that a lot. What, what does parallel thinking mean? And that's precisely that. We're all looking at things in parallel from the same perspective rather than all in different positions around the house. With our own perspective, you opened up this conversation talking about perspectives. We've got 8 billion people. You've got 8 billion perspectives. So if you've got a group of four people, how can you get them to have parallel thinking so they're starting to see things a little bit similar? Yeah, and it's it's brilliant that you bring this example because it's all about alignment, right? I mean, in simplistic terms, I mean, I, we talk about this in any space, whether it's change or management, leadership, no matter what, we're always saying, okay, you see a triangle, she sees a rectangle, you see a polygon. Can we all start to see it as a circle? Sure, we could, but we need us to get to the same perspective, right? I mean, we yeah. need to share our perspectives with each other. And unless we're seeing the same thing in the same way, we're not going to get to that alignment. And we're yeah. not saying it has to be a perfect circle. Maybe it's got some, you know, uh, rough edges on the side or whatever. But yeah, maybe anything that brings us together to align on that. So and that's that's exactly what you're saying. And it reminds me of the whole, uh, I think uh, when I started my agile journey, like, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, um, yeah, now I'm starting to give away the age, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, I, I remember there was this uh, talk about or, or this image of, you know, the elephant and there are yes. a couple of blind men around that, blind people around that and then saying, okay, oh, I think this is this. And then the other ones, no, this is a trunk. This is a this. I was like, that's interesting, right? Because you are on different sides of the elephant. So you're going to feel and touch and say different things, but who knows what it turns out to be. Just hundred percent. It's the yeah. exact same um, analogy. The um, yeah, the the blind people and the elephant. Is it is kind of analogous to the people around the house? Exactly. We're only seeing from our own perspective. And how can we get people to take those blindfolds off and all go and touch the trunk together, or all go and play with the elephant's ear at the same time to yeah. try and align that perspective? Because I'm not sure what your example is. Your, your uh, experiences, so we could be in organisations. Um, I see a lot of misalignment. In, in teams and the, the next layers up and the next layers up. But I see a lot of, we're not really sure what we should be doing together. That that lack of alignment, I think, is, is, is a problem. That's another brilliant point, Fran, because what I see is, yes, of course, there's always misalignment, but that is also the trigger for conflict, right? People jump into yes. conflict because of yes. that. And I've also seen if the teams are actually using the six thinking hats, they are able to understand and value everybody's perspective, right? They're like, oh, that's why you're saying what you're saying. And now I see it. All right. Even if all of them are looking then, you know, wearing one hat, looking in the same direction, they're still coming up with unique perspectives, even with the creative hat or the feelings, emotions, because we're still human. We're going to feel differently with probably the red hat. And 
it's interesting when we can come up with still unique perspectives and that's that's where i think this kind of an approach could even reduce conflict because it gives more understanding you resonate with the other people as you know in a very humane way yeah yeah i like that link 100% like that link so you can just to build on that i think i think you've touched on an important point with the conflict and i i think this definitely would help to um, alleviate reduce even eliminate conflict in these types of situations because of what we've spoke about when we're thinking um when we've got the blindfold on and you're trying to convince me that what you're feeling is is is, is rope and what i'm feeling i'm trying to convince you oh no no this is this is um, a mat or a tree trunk if i'm touching the the leg we can get into um a conflict or a debate because you think you're right i think i'm right exactly and then our egos kick in and sometimes our egos won't let us step back and defuse that situation and conflict can easily get out of hand whereas i think using this technique it it gets around that problem i i believe because we're looking at the same part of the elephant so we're aligned so i'm not trying to argue with you about what part of the elephant it is that so the conflict's gone but then what we can do is whilst we both agree now it's the legs it's the leg of the elephant hmm we can talk about what do we see about the leg of the elephant so we've still got like you've said there we've still got our own perspectives but we're not arguing about is it a leg or is it a trunk so yeah, yeah. fantastic link yeah yeah i just did one uh, workshop not not recent enough but i think it was the end of last year to exactly this point they were you know conflicted with many things and we tried using this and that brought more understanding so i was like I think it's a good technique just to use even in context and I had not used it so much you know in the context of a conflict so I said let's give it a try who knows what comes out and unless you try it you'll never know so yeah okay. yeah possible possible conversation for a future podcast conflict there's so much in there as well for sure for sure because I've been already using a lot with team agreements and stuff and I'm sure you and I can jump on another podcast on that so but let's let's put that on our list of talks to do <laughs> yeah yeah okay but then i i just noted another point while you were talking um how would you say um uh, you know this approach could be used for let's say for individuals and groups is there a similarity is there a difference is there a can't do cannot do what do you think what's what do you see yeah it's a great question and and i think what's surprising is i believe this techniques equally as effective for individuals as it is for groups so if you imagine the group scenario first of all we talked about you get people in a group all sorts of dynamics crop up ego comes into play we start looking versus each other rather than in parallel and the six thinking hat technique can can get us around that or through that i also think and something that didn't really occur to me till fairly recently is this is equally effective as an individual So if I've got um, a problem to sort out myself rather than just trying to maybe do a list of pros and cons and get lost in all the detail I can metaphorically put on the different hats so I could put on you know the 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 red hat what does this decision or this topic have me thinking or feeling mm. and just get all that out without judging it without labeling it just get it all out write it all down then take the hat off then I can put a different hat on put the white hat on right But what do the facts tell me? Not what I'm thinking and feeling and all the baggage I've got through my life experience, but what are the facts that we know are facts about this topic? I can get those down. And then, you know, just go through the six hats, but the I could put the black hat on and say, "Yes, you've got the facts, you've got the feelings, but what's a different way of looking at this? What's my blind spot? What have I not seen about this?" And I can go through that process and I'm not because I'm doing the hats I'm not mixing all those things up together. Thinking something and then immediately judging it. Coming up with a fact and then immediately discounting it. I'm just I'm doing one at a time. I'm looking in one direction but I've got one hat on. So I I think yeah the the surprise for me really Sweeka is this is really valuable for individuals working on the road and for teams and groups. Yeah, I love the example that you give even for the individuals, right? Because I mean business owners like you and me we use this don't we so i still remember doing an actual activity uh fran are you there your video seems to be hung 
All right, people, we have a technical glitch. Hang on. I'm waiting to hear from you, Fran. Hello. Okay, let me pause the recording. We'll wait for Fran to come back. All right, people, now that Fran's back and the video is not frozen, welcome back, Fran. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So, so I was basically just saying, so of course, you know, business owners like you and me, we definitely use these six thinking hats. And I remember I have even um, had a friend facilitate this for me once when I wanted to use this technique on myself just to strategize for the next quarter, what products I don't want to, you know, put out there for my yeah. clients. And I ended up thinking so holistically about the whole product package. And I was like, Okay, those four things are useless. They're not causing any value. Throw them away, which is good because I would end up putting my effort into just pretty much anything. Actually, just talking about that, I'm I'm just thinking of all the all lateral benefits that I'm getting with all of this. <laughs> I didn't think of this earlier. Magic's happening. Yeah, exactly. So so think about it. I just answered one of the key benefits. So if I'm looking at my product and if I'm using these hats to even Think about the value I'm offering to the customer and what products are not offering value. What do I want to keep? Why? What are the emotions that I see with that product? What emotions and feelings am I hearing from customers? What are the facts? What's the data? What's the feedback? You know, looking at all of this through those six hats, of course, I'm not covering all six here, but yeah, if you put on each of those hats and talk about them for products, I think it's a good bad product eliminating <laughs> approach so you just eliminate what, sh what you should not work on so in a way also prioritize what you should and should not work on at least i'm getting to that just by giving this example of some yeah interesting i'm finding yeah yeah and i think i thought yeah i think uh, what comes up for me there when you speak as well is is the flexibility of the six thinking hats because you don't have to use all six hats if you're doing it on yourself as a business owner, like you say, lots of decisions to make all the time, or if you're using it with the team, you don't have to use all six hats. You might choose to use two, three, four of the hats. You know, start with the blue hat, say to the team, we've only got 25 minutes today, so we're going to consider this issue, and we'll consider it from the through the lens of, let's be a bit creative, let's see what emotions come up for us, but then let's critique it. So you might just use three of the hats. So whilst all six are equally um, effective hats for thinking you might just use two or three of them so you can really tailor this to to fit the needs of the individual or the group that you're working with yeah definitely which brings me to an interesting question what challenges practically have you been seeing i mean what's like the most difficult thing that people encounter when trying out you know the six thinking hats because of course, there's so many benefits. I mean, we've been uncovering so many while talking too. some new ones coming up, which I had not thought of before our conversation. And uh, so so what are you seeing? I would say the, the, the biggest challenges that I see is the fact that we're all just people and all just humans. And we've we've been conditioned to behave in certain ways, in, especially in organizations. Certain behaviors get rewarded and we get conditioned culturally to whatever's behavior gets uh, rewarded in that organization so when you bring something like this in it's it's not easy it's not simple for people to switch off their conditioning and just start thinking with the one hat they've got on got on sorry because let's say for example we're we're now going on to the facts and we've got the white hat on and we we come to Sarika and Sarika you share some facts on this if I disagree with those facts if I think they're not true Hmm. I've got to fight the urge to disagree with you. Right. No, 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 so we can, no, 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 I, that's not right. I know that's not right. That's not true. Because th that's often our natural inclination yes. to, to prove that we're right and other people are wrong. Rather than saying, oh, there's your facts. I've got some facts as well. These are my facts. I find the hardest thing to your question, what's the most challenging thing is people will always be people. And, and that's probably why it takes good, strong facilitation. Somebody who understands the hearts, understands the purpose of the process and can facilitate a team through the process and get them back on track should they get off track. And, and let's be honest, teams and groups are going to go off track. 
teams and groups have this energy field between them that naturally occurs when they get together. Um, so you're going to see people being people. It's just how well and how effectively can we facilitate that to get them back into the process. I think a second, I could share a second caution as well, I think is trying to help people not to get too attached to the label, which, mm -hmm. which, which I've seen. So they say you put the black hat on. Oh, I'm great at this. I'm always a devil's advocate. I'm always playing this role. I'm really great. People get attached to the hat and the label, but they're not descriptors. They're just directions of, of thinking. So it's not describing me as a black hat thinker when I put it on. It's describing which direction I should look when I'm thinking. And again, I think it's just helping people through that natural inclination. We like to attach labels and categories because that's how the brains work. And we start looking around the room, oh, so because the, the green hat person and I'm the black hat and they're the yellow hat. It's, it's to move away from that and say, no, it's just a direction of thinking. We're all going to look in the same direction at the same time. The hats are not a descriptor of that person. So they're probably two of the main challenges I would see. The first challenge that you brought out, and I think the point I want to emphasize there is this beautiful process of facilitation, because yeah. facilitation is super key. And I think it's not just on the facilitator, it's also on those being facilitated. So the ones who are actively participating, because this is all a good balance between the two, right? I mean, so yeah. the facilitator and the active participants in it. And this is tough. It's very tough. People think it's like, oh, that's a great benefit. 45 minutes, we'll get done with the meeting. The amount of investment that goes in those 45 minutes to get this meeting done in 45 minutes, it's a lot of effort, but it's so worth it. So, so I mean, I, I just wanted to stress on that aspect that if not facilitated well, if we get our own biases in it, if, you know, we start falling prey to or being being a part of the whole process, then I think it's going to be very tough because we won't be able to keep our close to neutral stance. I don't want to say fully neutral because we're still human. We have to find ourselves falling into that trap and pull ourselves out of it. So close, keep your close to neutral, you know, uh, stance there as a facilitator and make sure we can get everyone's voices heard. That's super important because you obviously don't want people to be, you know, backing out of it. You want that engagement. And I think um, it's it's a beautiful process to bring out that engagement, especially if I as a facilitator start seeing things going. Otherwise, I would be like, OK, let's let's switch hats, you know, let's do this. And then going to your second piece of the challenge or maybe even a overarching one. I think overall, it's so tough. To switch hats it's just it's just tough and of course like yeah. I might be really great at a black hat uh, but that doesn't make me the best person on a black hat hat right yeah. I still have to be able to switch to another hat and see okay let me trigger the other part of my brain and now think so if I have to be creative how can I get creative on this problem how can I bring more ideas for my team and how can we better solve the problem? I think it's also about the language now that I think of it, but back to you. What came up for me there, Sarika, is you touched on it, is the power of facilitation. So to facilitate, to make easy, um, people do sometimes look from the outside and think, oh, that was an easy session, not knowing, like you've said, the effort that a facilitator puts in to have that session facilitated effectively. And and I think for me, it shows the power of having a facilitator or even a team coach. So the reason why high-performing teams need a team coach, because people are always going to be people, always got the best interests in mind, always got the best intentions, but then put one-on-one -on -one together, two people together, one-on-one -on -one doesn't make two, one-on-one -on -one makes three, because yeah. you've got the energy field between two people. So you imagine then you've got a team of six, um, it's very difficult for that team of six to step out of their natural conditioning in, into a process. So, yes, I, I don't want to lose sight of the point you made around the power of facilitation. It's absolutely key that you have effective, strong facilitation or team coaching to help people through this process. Awesome. Okay, I think uh, being sensitive on the time now, we've had a fantastic long conversation. This has been awesome. And I don't think I want to stop, but 
maybe in the interest of time, one other question. If you had to leave our audience with some two, three, five, I don't know how many powerful advice nuggets or whatever you call them, some actionable nuggets that, you know, they could literally go and try tomorrow. What would that be? Probably leave three, one, two, three. Okay. The first one would be read the book, Six Thinking Hats. So read the book. Um, the book's available in most libraries. I bought this copy. Um, but go to the library and get the book and have a read of the book. Understand the process, step one. Step two, I would say draw a picture. So for virtual here, just uh, on an iPad with, with a pen, draw the picture because – Having those visual visually there is is a great anchor point for teams if you're in a, a virtual session. And um, if you're in a, a real session with people in a room, I would say get pen and paper and do the same thing, but on a poster. So when we're in a conversation, we're saying we're switching hearts, you can point to the heart and people have got a visual reference there. That'd be step two. Step three would be go out and experiment, go out and play. Because what this technique brings to sessions, Srika, so something we haven't really touched on is, for me, it brings an element of play and creativity. Because the playfulness is around the, we're switching hats. And whether you do that with, you get six Lego minifigures and they put different hats on, or whether you make hats in the room, whether you buy six baseball caps of different colours, or whether you've just got the poster, there's a, there's a sense of playfulness and creativity in there, which which helps teams to achieve Great outcome. So I would say step three would be get out there, practice and play, inspect and adapt in the in the in the agile mindset, and um, just see what emerges. You might be very very surprised. I totally totally love these three pieces of advice, and you and I have already spoken. I've experimented with this also in a conference where we actually created hats out of chart paper. So that was so super fun. And yeah, you can imagine people listening and watching this. I mean, you can really get playful with this, right? Like like Fran said, whether you do that with actual Lego figures or, you know, wearing different color hats or, you know, actually just make hats or, you know, just draw them on a flip chart or whatever if you're in person. But have fun with it and be intentional. I think it's amazing, amazing nuggets. Okay. Um, even before I close, Fran, maybe one other question. I know I said that was the last, but yeah, just one other. So would there be anything that you probably thought you wanted to cover in the session, but, you know, it's popping up in your head and you're like, I just want to say this now to our audience, anything? I think I'd just double click on the go have fun, go and play, go and experiment. This, as we said at the very beginning, this is um, a very powerful technique. I don't think it's used um, enough in teams. And um, yeah, I would just say to people, you're not going to get it wrong because there is no right and wrong with this. It's just a just a process and a technique. Go and have some fun with it. Go and play with it. And um, yeah, go and, go and make some lateral decisions. Love that. All right, people. So if, you know, if you're watching us and if you've been listening to our podcast and podcast, then hopefully you've got some practitioner value out of this. We're going to get Fran on yet another amazing podcast. I'm not going to tell you the topic right now, but if you've been following us on LinkedIn, you will know which one uh, that was mentioned along with the six thinking hats. But that's going to be a very interesting one. Honestly, I haven't ever tried that technique out. So I am actually going to be very, very looking forward to those insights that I get from Fran's practitioner experience out there. So wait on for that. And until then, of course, enjoy this podcast. And I'm sure you will. And remember to like and subscribe to this channel too. So thank you so much, Fran. And I hope to see you again soon on an amazing podcast again. Thank you, Sarika. It's been an amazing conversation. Thank you.